Well, uh, hello everyone and uh, welcome to this wonderful talk. I'm Lynn Harmon Walker and I direct the GW Law Environmental and Energy Law Program in Washington, DC, which USU News just ranked as number 10 in the nation for environmental law programs. Thank you for attending this exciting discussion about the rule of five and the role that young lawyers trained at GW Law played in the hard fought landmark case of Massachusetts versus EPA. Please mute your mics, but you're very welcome to turn on your cameras um, for this event. I think that makes Zoom feel like uh, you're actually there in the, in the talk. So feel free to do that. Um, if we have time at the end of this very short hour, uh, we may be able to take a, uh, some questions uh, from, the, from the chat. So feel free to ask your questions or make your comments during the procedure. And I'll now turn over the mic to my esteemed colleague, Professor Robert Glicksman, the JB and uh, Maurice C. Shapiro, Professor for Environmental Law, who will uh, introduce our very distinguished guests. Thanks, Lynn, and thank, uh, thanks to all of you for your interest in and uh, willingness to attend today's uh, uh, conversation. We have three terrific speakers lined up for you. I'm gonna briefly introduce them and then I'll turn the program over to Professor Lazarus. So Richard Lazarus is the Howard and Catherine Abel Professor of Law at Harvard University, where he teaches environmental law, natural resources law, Supreme Court advocacy and torts. He represented the United States, state and local governments and environmental groups in the US Supreme Court in 40 cases and has presented all arguments in 14 of those cases. His primary areas of legal scholarship are environmental and natural resources law, with particular emphasis on constitutional law and the Supreme Court. Richard has published three books, The Making of Environmental Law, which traces the history of the development of environmental law in the US, uh, Environmental Law Stories, and The Rule of Five, which uh, is the subject of our conversation today. Richard was also the principal author of the um, report to the president on the National Commission on the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill, uh, for which he served as uh, the commission's executive director. Well, we're also gonna hear from two GW law grads, Joe Mendelson and Greg Garr. Joe Mendelson serves as senior counsel, business and policy development for Tesla Incorporated, where he leads the company's policy and government relations work on international trade, climate change and carbon pricing, as well as solar manufacturing and sustainability. From 2013 to 2015, Joe was the Democratic Chief Climate Counsel for the U.S. Senate's Committee on Environment and Public Works. Before that, he was Director of Policy for the National Wildlife Federation's Climate and Energy Program. He also co-founded and served as the Legal Director of the Center for Food Safety, the International Center technology assessment. Gregory Garr is a partner in the UE Washington DC office of Latham and Watkins, where he's the global chair of the firm's Supreme Court and appellate practice. He's considered one of the nation's top appellate advocates. Greg served as the 44th Solicitor General of the US in 2008-2009, after being unanimously confirmed to that position by the US Senate. As Solicitor General, he was the federal government's top lawyer before the Supreme Court and was responsible for overseeing the government's litigation in the federal appellate courts. He also served as principal deputy solicitor general for three years and as an assistant solicitor general before that. He's the only person to have held all those positions within the office of the solicitor general. Greg has argued 45 cases before the Supreme Court and has briefed and served as counsel of record in hundreds of additional cases for the court at both the merits and cert petition stages. So with that, I'm gonna turn the program over to Professor Lazarus, and he's gonna take a minute to uh, share a screen, and then we'll get started. Great, got the screen there? Terrific. Uh, thanks, Rob. I'm really delighted to participate in this event and encourage people to put their, uh, their videos on if they want. It's much more fun. Uh, to see everyone's uh, everyone's picture. Um, 
GW has really long been one of the leading environmental law programs in the nation. I think it was one of the first out of the block, out of the starting gate uh, back in the early 1970s. Most other major law schools have taken many decades to catch up uh, with, with GW. But here's a little known fact. Uh, and that is when I was in the Department of Justice in the late 1980s, I taught uh, at GW uh, Law School uh, as an adjunct on the side. I taught an evening course in natural resources law. Uh, so I first had firsthand experience in how terrific uh, the students are at GW. I'm also well familiar with how good the faculty is. It's always been really good. Uh, Lynn, uh, Rob, others, uh, and uh, you know, Rob's a giant. Uh, in environmental law and one of the nation's really leading uh, scholars. So you're really, really fortunate to have him uh, there. Uh, so as Rob suggested, I'm here to talk about my recently published book, The Rule of Five, uh, Making Climate History at the Supreme Court. Um, it's a special treat to do so here because as Rob uh, intimated, there's a real GW connection, GW law connection um, to my book. Uh, the book uh, story, I'm sorry, my talk will be divided into three parts. First, give you a sense of the arc of the story my overall goal in writing the book. Uh, second, to highlight uh, parts of the book's story and provide you the sense of the book's voice, uh, what makes the story, I think, so engaging, but also so important. And then I'm gonna pivot to a conversation with these two fabulous GW alums we have joining me today, uh, both of whom played a major role in the case this book is all about. Uh, and that's Massachusetts uh, versus EPA. Uh, Joe and Greg are not only graduates of GW Law, uh, they were classmates at GW Law, uh, entering law school in the fall of 1988 um, and graduating in the class of 1991. And they were opposing counsel uh, in this case, uh, which is, I think, pretty amazing. Uh, this is also an especially good day to talk about this story because this is the anniversary uh, of Massachusetts uh, versus EPA uh, and why when um, Lynn and Rob and Perry asked me when I wanted to give the talk. I said, I want to give it on April, on April 2nd uh, for the anniversary of it. Um, so the, the story's arc and its primary objective is divided into 20 chapters followed by an epilogue. Uh, the story's arc literally begins with a guy named Joe. Uh, and no, it's, it's, not, it's not that Joe. Uh, it's not Joe Exotic from, from those dark days of Tiger King we all suffered through uh, a year ago. Uh, when the pandemic first hit, it's a very different Joe. Uh, it's our Joe, uh, Joe Mendelson, who you're going to meet a little uh, more in a few minutes. And the story ends with a Supreme Court ruling that made history, uh, and that's Massachusetts versus EPA, often referred to as environmental law's uh, own Brown Board of Education, uh, a case which not only transformed U.S. climate change law, uh, but had worldwide impact. Now, my primary objectives in writing this book were twofold. First, I want to write a book for a popular audience, reveal what makes Supreme Court advocacy so challenging and so fascinating. It's a story I wanted to write about a case ever since I was an assistant to the Solicitor General, uh, uh, just like Greg was when he first started in that office, um, when I did that in the 1980s, when, when he and Joe were starting law schools when I was in uh, the Solicitor General's office. And I want to tell the story from both sides of the lectern. Uh, where this advocate stands to argue before the justices, then also the other side of the lectern. And that's where the, within the court itself, where the justices engage in their own advocacy uh, once the argument is over. I want to open a window to let the general public inside to see what the extraordinary amount of strategy, maneuvering, and conflict uh, in these cases, of the personal, sometimes professional drama, not from bad motives, but because the stakes are high. And the stakes don't get much higher than the United States Supreme Court. I also want to write a book for a general audience that revealed what made it, has made it so difficult for our country uh, to address the climate change issue. Uh, why it's proven so hard for reasons most don't know. And why for that re same reason this case was so important. Uh, there's no more important environmental issue facing the US and the world right now uh, than climate change. Uh, and the coronavirus underscores how there's no escaping the need for global cooperation for these kinds of global threats. So I began researching the book in 2015, 2016, really wrote it in 2018, 2019, uh, and published it uh, a year ago. I was originally supposed to give this talk on April 2nd, uh, 2020 at, at GW, but you may remember something happened uh, right before I was supposed to give that talk. Um, 
Uh, I approached the research for this book the way I would a Supreme Court brief, uh, scorched earth research. Uh, interviewed everybody, Clinton administration officials, Bush administration officials, lawyers on both sides, judges, justices, uh, and with permission, I would talk to law clerks. I wouldn't talk to a law clerk unless a judge or a justice gave permission. I can't do that, not as a law professor. If they gave permission, then I would talk uh, to their clerks. And I, people I interviewed include both Joe uh, and Greg. I also sought all the underlying documents. I ended up knowing far more about this case than any of the people who had litigated uh, the case. I did public record requests uh, from government agencies to get their documents, but also people gave me uh, their material voluntarily. I got boxes and boxes of material, uh, jump drives, emails, and the rest helped me put together uh, the story. So here are a few highlights from the book. These are illustrative parts of the story. Uh, chapter one, of course, uh, opening scene uh, with the real Joe uh, of the story, not Joe Exotic, uh, but Joe Mendelson. It's October 1999. After a year delay, Joe Mendelson walks from his Capitol office down to EPA and hand delivers a petition demanding the Clinton EPA, the Clinton EPA regulate greenhouse gas emissions from new motor vehicles. At that point, Joe is just fed up. He's fed up by the lack of any action by the Clinton administration on the climate issue. Uh, so who was Joe? Uh, Joe arrived at GW in the fall of 1988 determined to be a public interest lawyer. And after law school, he did just that. Uh, and he did it the hard way. Uh, he worked for a public interest organization few people had heard of, and that is the International Center for Technology Assessment. They had about a total of five employees, uh, full-time and part-time total. Uh, they worked paycheck to paycheck, uh, and sometimes for no paycheck at all. Uh, they had a small office on Capitol Hill, and they were evicted not long before we filed the petition for violating a local Zordon ordinance for having an office in a residential uh, neighborhood. Uh, and Joe worked very much alone. He worked on the, on the petition late at night uh, by his daughter's crib. Uh, and none of the powerful national environmental groups like NRDC, Sierra Club, Earth Just, Environmental Defense, none of them supported what he was doing. In fact, they actively opposed him. And at some point early in the litigation, they tried at one point to cut off his funding uh, to stop uh, what he was trying to do uh, here. Uh, and Joe refused to bend. Uh, he filed a petition demanding the EPA act. Uh, his feeling was, these organizations are not my bosses. You can't tell me what to do. Uh, this is, I think, important to do. Uh, it took a year to make that decision. Uh, and he finally pulled that petition out of his desk drawer uh, and pulled the trigger. He walked it down to the EPA and hand filed it. The petition made its way to a docket room uh, at EPA, where it was formally received by a docket clerk. Uh, named Janie Poole. Uh, she put in a cart, she put in a cart, a metal cart, uh, and they rolled it down to the general counsel's office at EPA. But I can tell you, no one then imagined uh, that that petition would find its way eight years later in the United States Supreme Court. But at first, there was actually reason to think that actually EPA might grant Joe's petition, uh, but not the Clinton EPA, which sat on it and did nothing, but the Bush EPA. Uh, might grant it. Because when George Bush took office in January 2001, there was every reason to think that, in fact, he would grant that petition. Because unlike Al Gore, he had campaigned for office and made a campaign pledge to regulate greenhouse gas emissions under the, under the Clean Air Act. Um, and he appointed to his cabinet a whole series of very important heavyweight individuals who were determined to be aggressive on the climate issue. Christine Todd Whitman was made head of EPA. Uh, Christine Todd Whitman was a household name back then. She was presidential timber. She was governor of New Jersey. She was a hawk on the climate question. She took the job because she believed uh, on the climate question. No one had been made ahead of EPA with as much national stature as Christine Todd Whitman. Secretary of State was Colin Powell, who believed that this was a national security threat. He held a briefing on climate change issue within a week of taking office. Condoleezza Rice was National Security Advisor. She shared the same views on climate uh, as both Powell uh, and Whitman. Uh, this was a first order issue of national importance. But no one was more of a hawk on climate than Paul O'Neill, the Secretary of Treasury. He felt so strongly about the climate issue that he went to the White House early before the first cabinet meeting in January 2001 
went to the, into the room and put in front of the table, the chair of every member of the cabinet, a copy of a speech he had given before, comparing the threat of climate change to nuclear holocaust. They were all determined to do it until this guy came in and kneecapped them all. He outmaneuvered them. Vice President Dick Cheney, he was known as the angler for a reason. That was his moniker. And that's because he knew the way to do things in DC. Within just a few weeks, without consulting with any of them, he circumvented them and he got the President of the United States, George Bush, to renege on his campaign pledge and to make a decision that greenhouse gases, not only was he not going to regulate them as a matter of policy, but in fact, they were not pollutants under the Clean Air Act. He had the President of the United States answer a legal question, not just a policy question, a question of law, without consulting with the Department of Justice, without consulting with the EPA, without consulting with Christine Todd Whitman, or any of the lawyers at EPA. Uh, that was a mistake. It's always good to talk to your lawyers. Uh, but they went ahead and did it, and they led to EPA, because he is the President of the United States, George Bush, you do what your, what your boss tells you to do. They denied the petition. They denied the petition uh, basically arguing, right, concluding uh, that, as the president said, greenhouse gases are not, are not air pollutants. And also, EPA added, it's not the right time to make a decision here anyway. Uh, there was nothing easier or smooth, however, about the path to the Supreme Court. They had to first go to the first court, and uh, that's the D.C. Circuit. D.C. Circuit, some of you know, has exclusive jurisdiction over Clean Air Act cases. goes right there. There's no district court first. By the time the case reached uh, the courts, Joe was no longer alone, though. There were hundreds of lawyers on his side, from about a dozen states, more than two dozen environmental groups. They called themselves the carbon dioxide warriors. Uh, some played more important roles than others. Uh, Joe was an, a central player on that team. Uh, when it started, he was the player. And he was still there, as you'll see, at council table when it reached the Supreme Court uh, a few years later. They lost the first round of the D.C. Circuit uh, in front of a three-judge panel, Centel, Randolph, and Tatel. Uh, and that court, in a very fragmented, uh, splintered opinion, uh, two to one, uh, held that EPA had properly exercised discretion denying the petition for rulemaking. The court did not reach the question whether greenhouse gas or air pollutants. In fact, they didn't reach any question at all because Sendell and Randolph both thought EPA should win, but they had no overlapping rationale uh, for why. Uh, so it was a two to one to affirm EPA, deny the petition, but on no ground creating no uh, precedent. At that point, the question was whether to seek further review. And after that loss in the DC circuit panel, everyone, Every one on the, on the Massachusetts environmental group side, everyone but one thought they should end the case. There was only really one attorney out of those hundreds who thought that they should seek further review, let alone the Supreme Court. Uh, Jim Milkey from Massachusetts, uh, AG's office, he believed they should roll the dice. Uh, he said, let's not acquiesce in this loss. Let's give it a chance. Let's take a chance. Uh, all of us thought it was a terrible idea. They would risk a major loss in the court. And their concerns were not, not crazy, right? Uh, there was good reason to worry about taking this case further. Uh, they had lost in the DC circuit, but with no adverse precedent. If they lost on appeal, they lost in the Supreme Court and they might lose on standing, that could be a disaster of a loss. So it was a real roll of the dice uh, about whether to go. And Jim Mookie was under, under enormous pressure not to file. In fact, the president of the Natural Resource Defense Council wonderful person, Frances Beinecke at the time, she called Jim Milkey's boss and said, don't do this. She called Jim Milkey and said, the future of the environmental movement is on your head uh, for take seeking Supreme Court uh, review. Uh, but they couldn't stop Massachusetts. Anyone could file. They couldn't stop Milkey. Uh, so we filed. Uh, and they filed a cert petition in the United States Supreme Court. They brought a new brief writer, Lisa Heinzley, a former colleague of mine at Georgetown, principal author of the cert petition, did a terrific job on that, on that cert petition. Uh, and at this point, everyone joined the petition, but not because they thought it was a good idea, but because they wanted to control what Milky said, and they actually thought the court wouldn't grant it anyway. And there was reason to think they wouldn't grant it. Uh, there was nothing about this case in terms of what had been decided to make it cert worthy. The DC circuit had not created a circuit conflict. DC circuit hadn't created any precedent at all of any kind. They had done no ruling, let alone no circuit uh, conflict. And the last time the Supreme Court had granted a petition 
at the request of the environmentalists over the federal government's opposition was 1971. So there's little reason to think they were granted and no one could believe when they did. But on June 26, 2006, they did. Uh, you recognize some other cases they granted that day. There's some interest for law students, interesting cases granted on June 26, uh, 2006. Uh, and the environmental groups in the state, they couldn't believe it, right? Uh, they were sort of dumbstruck um, with their reaction uh, on it uh, in one way or another. And then Milky is sitting there, the one who had wanted it, and he's going, uh-oh, what have we done? Because now the future of our movement might well be on his head. It takes four votes to grant review. It takes five votes to win. You never know who the four are who are voting to grant review. They could be the four who want to, who want to give you um, a loss uh, later on. Uh, so they then filed their briefs in the Supreme Court, uh, brief for the petitioners, brief for the federal respondent. There are also some industry briefs uh, there as well. Uh, Joe was on the brief uh, for the uh, petitioners uh, and Greg Garr uh, as Deputy Solicitor General and the Principal Deputy Solicitor General. Uh, he's on the brief uh, for the federal uh, government. Uh, the next several chapters of the book describe the oral, oral argument uh, in the case. Uh, and they're designed to give the reader the sense uh, of the stunning physical setting of the courtroom, uh, the extraordinary grandeur of that room. It's Cass Gilbert was the architect, coupled with the physical intimacy. When the court opens up again, if you haven't been there already, make sure you go. The advocate stands 74 inches away from the Chief Justice of the United States. So you're in this huge room, but they wrap around you, the justices. If the Chief Justice were to lean over and Greg Gar as an advocate were to lean over, they could touch hands. Uh, you're, that, you're that close. It's that kind of intimacy. Um, and there's an extraordinary give and take between the justice and the advocates, but also in the justices, because by tradition, the justices have a tradition of not talking about the case before the oral argument. So that's the first time they learn what each other is thinking about the case. And the one hour of argument is the longest time they're likely ever discuss the case together uh, in one room. It gives the advocate an enormous opportunity to participate in that conversation. Just when the justice are finding out what each other is thinking, the advocate is there and their questions go through the advocate. Uh, so it's an unbelievable. Every question is like a light bulb goes up and it tells you what they're thinking. Uh, but the advocate's challenge is considerable. They have to decide how to frame the issues in the way most likely to win. And it's often a huge difference. You can frame a case one way and lose. You can frame a case another way and win or at least might win. It's all about framing when it comes to the United States Supreme Court. You often have to ask, anticipate all the hard questions and develop crisp answers. Um, you can't go in there so confident that you win that you haven't figured out what the weaknesses of your case are because the justice will figure out the weaknesses, what they are. So you figure them ahead of time so you know the best possible answers. The norm right now is you have to answer 50 to 60 questions in 30 minutes. That's how many times you're interrupted with questions. The justice's questions are equivalent of trying to hit a major league baseball pitch. If you think about it, you got 30 minutes and 50 to 60 questions. The questions themselves are gonna take up a fair amount of your time. You have gotta answer really quickly and really efficiently. If you don't, they're gonna stop talking to you because you're no help to them. Uh, they, the court today doesn't do what Justice White used to do in the 1980s. When Justice White was on the bench, if he thought the advocate was of no help to the court, he'd turn his chair around and just rock. So all the advocate would have is the justice's back. Uh, and the Justice White was fairly senior. But that was saying, if we're done with you, you're of no help to us. Uh, the book describes the oral argument in detail. Uh, both Joe and Greg were at counsel table uh, that day, uh, of course, along with the justices, uh, Greg argued uh, before the court. Uh, Jim Milkey argued uh, for Massachusetts and the environmental groups. Uh, for Jim Milkey on the petitioners on Joe's side, uh, it was an intense day. Uh, there were 56 interruptions with questions uh, during his 30 minutes. 23 of those questions came from Justice Scalia alone. Uh, 
uh, Justice Scalia was not there to do um, uh, Joe's side any favors uh, that day. Another 18 questions came from the Chief Justice. Uh, when Greg stood up there, uh, he had 55 questions uh, in his 30 minutes, 55 interruptions and questions. But the justice is completely different. Uh, for him, the main justice asking questions were Justices Breyer, Justice Souter, and Justice John Paul Stevens. And the three of them asked him 15, 13, and nine questions respectfully. It was a very lively argument uh, and very engaged court uh, with two advocates fielding 110 questions and interruptions uh, in, 60, uh, in 60 minutes. The last chapters of the book uh, shift the story from the one side of the lectern to the other. Uh, once the Chief Justice says the case is submitted, bangs the gavel on November 29th, 2006, the justices all go back behind the curtains to their chambers. And two days later, uh, on December 1st, uh, 2006, they come in to the conference room and they sit around uh, the conference table. They do it in a particular order uh, by seniority. The Chief Justice as the most senior sits on one end, uh, the next most senior uh, justice, Justice Paul, John Paul Stevens, sits on the other, and then they go around in seniority. Uh, here's Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, Souter, Ginsburg, Breyer, Alito, the most junior justice, is the one who has to take the notes, and he has to answer the door in case anyone knocks on it. No one else is allowed in the room. No law clerks, completely confidential setting. And they go around that morning, and they vote. The chief goes first. Uh, then Stevens. Uh, they don't all talk and then vote. They actually vote uh, from the most junior, so senior to the most junior, opposite DC circuit. They go from most junior to most senior. Supreme Court goes most senior to most junior. It means if it's a 9-0 case, by the time you get to the junior justice, no one cares what they think because they already decided. Uh, uh, in this case, although it was five to four, uh, Alito wasn't the big news in how he's voting. As soon as they got to Justice Kennedy and he voted in favor of Massachusetts, in favor of the environmental groups and Joe's position, that's when you knew the case was which way uh, it was going. Uh, so they went around the room. It was five to four. Uh, it was five to four with Justice John Paul Stevens as a senior justice in the majority. In, in majority. Uh, now, what happens next is the way the court works is the senior justice in the majority is the one in charge of deciding who writes the opinion for the court. And that's a big deal because an opinion can be written either very broadly or very narrowly to reach the same judgment. It's even more importantly a big deal if the initial vote is five to four because justices migrate. They change their votes. They're not, in, they're not permanent set votes until you get five justices to join an opinion. So someone has to write an opinion and keep those five votes. Uh, and I went down uh, to Florida. And I talked to John Paul Stevens about this because he had to decide who to give the opinion assignment to. And there were two obvious people. One, John Paul Stevens, right? It was a big case, a case very important to him, he told me. It was one of the few cases that the more liberal progressive justices actually had a majority that entire uh, October term, or that entire year of Supreme Court arguments. He very much wanted to assign it to himself. He felt strongly about the climate issue. And he was frustrated, he told me, frustrated that people in his own party, he was a devout Republican, People in his own party were not taking the climate issue seriously. He wanted to write this opinion to the American people and not just the lawyers um, and to the parties uh, in the case. Uh, but at the same time, he knew if he assigned it to himself, he was taking a chance because Justice Kennedy was known to migrate. He was known to shift his opinion, shift his view during the opinion writing process. He had done that in ca big cases before, both to, to either side, uh, of the group on the court. He had done that the year before in a Clean Water Act case to Justice Scalia. He did it quite famously in the civil rights case to Justice Brennan when he assigned opinion uh, to himself and then he lost Kennedy's vote. So the easy thing here to do would be to assign the opinion to Justice Kennedy. That's what you do, that's your strategy. You assign to Kennedy, he will write it the way he needs to keep it and he'll feel some possession, some institutional responsibility to do it. But John Paul Stevens said, I'm gonna assign it to myself. And then he had to work to keep Kennedy's vote. It didn't take one draft, two drafts, three drafts, four drafts. It took him eight drafts to get Kennedy's vote. He had, he had four votes right away and there were four votes for dissent. He had to make accommodations along the way, compromise along the way to keep Kennedy's vote. But after eight drafts and a couple months, he got it. 
That's why I referred to him as the Bowtie Jedi Master. Uh, Justice John Paul Stevens, when he first got on the court in the 70s, was known for his own lone opinions, his iconoclastic views on things. By the time he left the court by the 90s and became the senior uh, justice uh, on the more progressive side, he became the master of the rule of five. And that is, it takes five votes to get a, a ruling from the Supreme Court. And, he'd be, and if you read his opinion, you'll see how he does it. It's like a group hug of Justice Kennedy, that opinion, in every way that he could. And he wrote the opinion in a sweeping way. It almost reads like a 1970s uh, opinion. Uh, he starts out talking about the important issue of climate change. He talks who the respected scientists are. It's a call to action by the Supreme Court on the climate. Uh, question. Um, chapter 20 uh, goes on to talk about how uh, the case makes history. It doesn't happen at the end of the Bush administration. It happens during the Obama administration because the Obama administration takes EPA's loss in Mass versus EPA and they run with it. They run with that loss. Uh, they never get legislation through, but the entire climate agenda, almost all of it, is based on Mass versus EPA. And they spend eight years promulgating ambitious regulatory programs to show the rest of the world that the United States is finally seriously going to take uh, climate change and do something about it. Because until the United States does it, the rest of the world wasn't going to sign a national treaty. And so Obama administration started in January 2009 uh, through its eight years, tried to make the showing to the world based on mass versus EPA. And that's what led to the Paris Agreement uh, in December 2000. Uh, 15. That agreement would not have happened without Massachusetts versus EPA, the world's first climate uh, agreement. Uh, that's my story. That's the book. I'm happy to talk about other things, including the epilogue, but I want to truncate a little bit this time because I want to I want to take advantage of who we got uh, visiting with us uh, this time, uh, and that's uh, Joe uh, and Greg, uh, who played you know major roles uh, in this. So Joe and Greg, I thought it might be fun. Uh, to ask you both um, a few questions uh, about the case. So if you can unmute, uh, that way you won't have to figure out the unmute once I ask the question. So first one is to, is to you, Joe. Uh, so you, you know, as you know, you place, face enormous pressure uh, not, to, not to bring this case in the first instance, uh, including that funding cutoff. You were a young parent at the time. You were making much money. You guys didn't have a lot of funding uh, at the time. So what motivated you? Uh, and uh, did you ever, ever imagine this case might happen in the Supreme Court? Um, well, hello, everyone. And, and uh, Richard, thanks for uh, writing the book and uh, being so generous to me. And thanks to GW Law for not only the, the foundation that uh, you know started my career, but also for uh, hosting this event. Um, you know, I, I think uh, the motivation was, um, as, as you mentioned, uh, I, I went to law school to be an environmental nonprofit lawyer. Um, you know, 1995 was the, the, the second IPCC report on climate change. Uh, even then, the, the, uh, the scientific issue in, uh, of climate change was, was one that uh, was catching world attention and, and, and ha the ramifications of it um, were what I would say is the, the biggest environmental issue that there is. It, it, is an umbrella that covers all environmental issues. And so um, wanting to work on that issue and, and knowing that uh, uh, it was something that was gonna affect the future uh, in, in so many ways, um, this was an issue that myself and, and my colleague, Andy Kimbrell at the International Center for Technology Assessment said, no matter what we do uh, in our other work, uh, we have to carve out a, a piece to work on climate change. And, um, and at the time, just focusing on the, the vehicle side, um, there had been efforts in Congress to try and pass fuel economy uh, legislation that, that had stalled. Uh, there was the EPA was working on what was called the tier two regulation, tailpipe regulations for conventional pollutants. Uh, and EPA scurried under the desk whenever CO2 was mentioned. And so we said there has to be another way. And uh, we looked for it and we found it. And, um, we were just set on, on on taking that course of action. And any any thought, anything possible that this case in the Supreme Court that ever dawned on you? No, uh, no, uh, in, <laughs> absolutely not. Um, 
when you showed the original petition, it, it, it looks like a complaint. Um, that was a trick that I learned actually at GW Law School from Professor Banzaf in his legal activism class. He said, you know, you can, there, there are all sorts of things you can present to, to different agencies or uh, government officials and why not make it look official even if it's not. Now, of course, under the Administrative Procedure Act, it's an official petition and, but you know, I, I, I've had colleagues who filed petitions for federal agencies and waited 20 years to get an answer and send a cake like every year that, you know, the, the answer is waiting, <laughs> they're waiting for it. So, uh, it, you know, it was, it was the first Hail Mary, maybe not, you know, in, in the case. Uh, it's a good point. The government did not have to respond to your petition. Uh, and that's one of the questions is, is why they did. So, uh, uh, Greg, uh, you know, Joe picked his case, right? Uh, he picked his uh, position. Um, you're Deputy Solicitor General of the United States. Uh, you don't pick your cases. You don't pick your position. You've got clients. Uh, you've got clients, like most lawyers have clients, but you're in the public sector. Uh, and here you have a client to defend. Um, uh, defend, you know, you didn't create the record uh, uh, of the agency. You didn't make the argument below, but yeah, I've got a Supreme Court case. Um, and this was a, a tough one. I just mean, it was, it was not one that would obviously wouldn't win, uh, but you had to answer 55 questions in 30 minutes. Um, uh, and you had, I read, read the transcript, a very tenacious Justice Souter, who really is like, you know, he's a, he was a wonderful guy, but boy, uh, at argument, uh, about as tough as they come. Uh, what are your recollections uh, of the case? How, were you surprised when they granted review uh, and of the argument in particular? Yeah, no, thanks. Um, and thanks for having me here today. Thanks, GW. And Joe, it's nice to see you. We haven't seen each other since the argument, but congrats. Likewise. Likewise, Greg. Great to see you. Yeah. And let me just say, too, um, it's a great book uh, for all of you who haven't read it. I really encourage you to read it. Um, you know, every Supreme Court case is a story. And, you know, this book tells the story of the case. And this case is obviously, you know, exceptionally important. So I, I would encourage you to read the book. And, yeah, I mean, other than that, I'd sort of like to forget the day of the argument. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, as, as Professor said, but so I was I was actually not the deputy originally signed to this case. Tom Hungar was, and he worked on it through the search stage. And then when they granted, um, the Solicitor General asked me to sort of get involved and plan to argue the case. And so I, I had to do sort of a crash course on this. And, you know, this was a, an exceptionally complex case given the underlying science of climate change the you know underlying complexity of the administrative law going into it and and the standing issue which ended up being the most important issue before the the court and you know at oral argument both sides went out of their way and then i think this was true in the briefs true to, to say that you know this case was not about an indictment um, or recognition or denial of global climate change. It was about these administrative law issues. But I think it's clear from the opinion that ultimately, you know, the justices did see this as a case, the five did, about the importance of recognizing global climate change. Um, and that sort of drove their thinking. And, you know, going into this case, this is very much of a, a case that I think that could have gone either way. I mean, I think the professor is right that. Um, you know, it was by, by no means clear that the court was going to grant this case. But once they granted, you know, it was a case that was going to go either way. And I think probably most sides saw Justice Kennedy as the, the justice in the middle. And, and, you know, the case is known as the global warming case. And, you know, I, I think, as I said, I mean, I think ultimately that's what's going on here. But legally, the question was one of standing. Uh, which gets to the, the role of the courts in, in deciding to intervene on, on public issues. And, you know, here, the, the standing argument and issues sort of centered on whether Massachusetts, who is the lead plaintiff, could, you know, adequately say that if the EPA regulated greenhouse gas emissions from cars in the United States, that this would ultimately redress its claimed harm that it could lose coastline you know, over the course of a century, which, you know, the government argued, I argued, was, you know, too speculative um, to support Article Three standing, you know, particularly given that global climate change isn't a zero-sum game about what the United States does. It's, you know, a very complex game in terms of what the whole world does. 
And you know, if the United States regulated greenhouse gas emissions, there's absolutely no guarantee that China, uh, India, or other developing countries would. And so, so that was the argument. But um, recollections and oral argument were, you know, one, Justice Souter was uh, extraordinarily engaged. He was someone who, once he um, sort of sunk his teeth into an argument or person, an advocate, wouldn't let go. And I had numerous exchanges with him about um, why it was that Massachusetts hadn't adequately shown a connection between greenhouse gas emissions and um, the, the uh, survival of its coastline. And then the other, you know, what ultimately ended up being the most important part of oral argument was Justice Kennedy. And Justice Kennedy surprised everyone by um, introducing in the case um, a century old decision that really hadn't been discussed in the briefs at all called uh, Georgia versus Tennessee Copper on the question of standing. And that case involved a, a nuisance action. And in the case of Supreme Court, it might've been Justice Holmes, I might be misremembering. Um, it's Holmes. Okay, it's Holmes basically said that, you know, courts have sort of a more of a, almost like a parent's patriarch capacity um, in, to, to bring standing claims on behalf of their people to protect from environmental harms. In that case, it was noxious gases coming across from Tennessee into, into Georgia. And so, you know, one of the challenges there is, is you always want to be prepared for oral argument, every question you're going to get. And here, Justice Kennedy, the most important justice in the case, comes in um, asking about a case that hadn't been briefed and that, you know, looking at Justice Stevens's opinion ultimately was dispositive. So that was sort of an added challenge too. Remember Jim Milkey, uh, the, uh, Kennedy raised the, the case, Georgia Tennessee Copper with Milkey. Milkey had no idea what the case was. And he told me afterwards, his feeling was, well, if it's good enough for Justice Kennedy, it's good enough for me. Uh, but it wasn't like he knew. Uh, Joe, what about you? Do you have recollections of the argument? Oh, well, um, I do remember sitting down at the table thinking, what a journey. Um, and to, to be in the Supreme Court uh, on an issue as, as important as climate change, um, it, it couldn't get any better. You just, the, the magnitude really hit. Um, I, I, I distinctly remember um, on our side, Justice Scalia just going at it with Jim. Um, making uh, numerous statements about the, the science of climate change and the, the speculative nature of it. Um, uh, <laughs> it, it, it certainly not a, a, a legal issue and had no bearing on the case, but that 74 inches, I, I remember Justice Breyer uh, being so close uh, that actually, um, you know, it, it I almost felt his breath. I mean, really, when he was hammering it at, at, at Greg, I think, on <laughs> one issue. Um, yeah, yeah. I felt it too. Pardon? I felt it too. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I, I, I just remember scribbling, also scribbling furiously when questions were, were asked, and it's, it's to your I mean, Greg. Greg is well practiced, in, in, in even you know, uh, you know, uh, a decade later, plus um, even more so. But you know, my first time being at the council, I'm council table, the only time uh, I'm scribbling notes for Jim and Lisa about you know possible responses, and you realize you don't have time. You know, you don't. It was much more even than other oral arguments that I had ever been in. Uh, you know, at, at the Court of Appeals or District Court. So I just remember in some ways being uh, frustrated, frustrated like an attorney and that you've got ideas that you want to put forward and you don't have the time to react. So it, it goes to, uh, to uh, you know, how well Jim ultimately did in, in the oral argument that, that uh, he didn't need our notes and was well prepared and, and thankfully so. I'm going to ask another couple of questions, but uh, Rob, I'm encouraging the, uh, our audience members in GW to submit questions, I guess, through chat, and maybe Lynn is going to curate the questions. So I'll ask a couple more than questions for for uh, uh, Joe or Greg or, or me. So Greg, I think one thing I remember when I talked to you about this case a long time ago, uh, two things. One is I remember you said that when you were driving to the court that morning, you saw people outside the court wearing shorts, right? Yeah. <laughs> Any reaction to that? 
Yeah, I was, I was going to mention that because that actually is my most vivid recollection of the day and it happened before the oral argument and you know when you work in the solicitor general's office there's a van that drives you up to the court and i remember driving up and looking out in the mall and seeing people in shorts and thinking like this was not a good omen for the global warming case because the case was argued at the last day in november and you know i just remember thinking that was a bad idea and uh, you know i think i told the professor i'm convinced to this day that we might have won the case if it had been snowing but um it was a war it was an unseasonably warm day in DC, which I'm sure did not help. The other thing is okay, quickly, Greg, and then we'll see where we got some uh, questions. And that is um, that you write down on a piece of paper before you go up there. Uh, you write down uh, two words that you take with you uh, for most art, in addition to wearing a watch that I think your father or grandfather yeah. gave you. And, and the words are what and why do you uh, bring them with you? Well, I, I write down, uh, be thankful for, and, and, and also to enjoy, uh, and you know, a few other things like uh, stop and listen to the questions. And these are the very last things I look at before I go up to the, that, the podium. And you know, to be thankful, you, you know, it's, it's a highly uh, stressful situation for anyone to go through, whether it's your first argument or you know, whatever, and that, it, that never changes. And so to me, um, you know, I want to remind myself that like, this is like as good as it gets um, if you're an attorney to stand up before these justices and important issues. And, and you know, this case uh, certainly was, was one of the most important that I argued in. Um, and then also to enjoy it because, you know, the, the arguments fly by and it's the heat of the moment. But um, like, if you're not going to enjoy this, then kind of what's the, the point of going through all the work and everything you've done? To get there, and so that those are you know reminders that I have to to help calm me a little bit before I actually get up. Right. All right, uh, Lynn, do we have some questions? There, there are such good questions here, but uh, the first I, I is why did major nonprofits like NRDC oppose the International Center for Technology Assessments petition to the EPA? Joe, why don't you take that one on? Ah. Uh, yeah, um... Yes. Um, well, it, it's important to note everyone was on board. Uh, you know, when we when we got to the Supreme Court, as, as Richard highlighted. Um, you know, I think at the time there was uh, a feeling of concern that we that a loss would be um, potentially insurmountable. Um, California itself at the time was working through its uh, zero emission vehicle regulation. Um, and, and while it was justified in, in a waiver it sought at, at EPA mainly on uh, criteria pollutants, uh, it was it was known that in the, the the real effort was was to start uh, looking at CO2, and um, and so there was a, there was certainly a train of thought that um, that uh, the advocates wanted uh, the issues in California to um, proceed uh, and, and California uh, uh, under the Clean Air and other states can adopt and did adopt California uh, emission standards. Uh, but I, 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 the general feeling was let's let California, which is um, uh, you know, maybe more progressive leaning um, that there was uh, an EPA uh, that, that frankly at that time looked like it was gonna be a Gore administration coming afterwards uh, and that regulation would would maybe follow uh, and indeed uh, the the Clinton EPA called us in um, uh, before it was uh, you know it's it's time had run to say hey we've received the petition and under a Gore administration we may publish that petition in the Federal Register and ask questions 10 questions uh, maybe or so get us down the road and start you know do a steady, uh, take a steady march towards regulation as opposed to in one false swoop. So that was a, the, the thought, um, you know, we were impatient. We had the luxury of being small NGO um, with solid funding uh, for the most part. Um, and we also said, well, why don't we secure uh, that this question is on, uh, is on the docket in essence, that we've, we filed it intentionally uh, in 99, knowing that after a year plus, uh, there was gonna be a new administration, whether it was Gore or, or Bush. And uh, 
uh, let's have this issue presented right before EPA uh, when that new administration comes to being. So uh, it was a dispute of, you know, ultimately of, of strategy, um, but it was certainly one that was contentious. Yeah, sounds like it. Thank you, Andrew, for that question. We, we have a, it looks like we have a question from Professor Glixman in the queue here. Um, as an advocate, how does one respond when a judge or justice asks a question about a case you haven't briefed and aren't familiar with? So either of our ad advocates, do you have a ready answer for that? Well, Greg, you take it away. Not to, I'm not saying, Greg, right. you've ever had that happen to you, but take it away anyway. Um, the first time that happened to me, the judge was asking about the Smith case and I was horrified because it was one of my first arguments. And I thought, my God, I can't believe this is happening to me. And then he said, you know, the Joe versus Smith case. And I was like, well, I know that case. I just hadn't been thinking of it the right name. So that's, that's one way to get out of it. But no, I mean, what you say is you acknowledge that you aren't familiar with that case. And, you know, but, but if the court has questions, you'd, you know, be happy to follow up with the submission. You don't try to, um, you know, fudge your way through it because it, it'll quickly become much worse. <laughs> and, and actually, I saw someone try to do that, Greg, uh, and your former justice, uh, Greg Clerk for uh, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist. Uh, someone did that in oral argument. I was, it was not me. <clears throat> I was in the courtroom. Um, uh, and um, O'Connor asked the question, don't you think Smith v. Jones supports your case? And the advocate said, yes, it does. And Rehnquist smelled a rat <laughs> as Chief Justice. And he said, oh, counsel, tell me exactly how does Smith v. Jones support your case? And the guy sort of made something general up. No, he said, no, no, tell me exactly what is it about that case uh, that supports your position? Uh, and the guy finally, finally Rehnquist said, you have no idea what that case is about, do you? And the guy had admit that was right. So it does, it's not a good idea to try to bluff your way uh, through. Uh, Lynn, any, any others? Yeah, so um, Beth asks, what are your thoughts on the recent cases using this Clean Air Act coverage of CO2 as a basis to say that cities or states cannot bring claims for damages against fossil fuel companies? Yeah, Beth is referring to a decision by the Second Circuit yesterday um, called uh, City of New York v. Chevron. Uh, this is a case brought under the state common law of nuisance uh, for monetary damages against a whole series of multinational oil companies uh, seeking, uh, again, monetary relief based on the adverse effects of climate change. Uh, this, this is the first one of these cases to really reach a court of appeals, a federal court of appeals. And the Second Circuit uh, unanimously uh, ruled uh, that there is no uh, cause of action. Uh, that any state, uh, any state law, I think common law or statutory, uh, would be preempted um, by the federal common law. Uh, that's a, not a, a non-controversial holding because the Clean Air Act itself has a provision uh, expressly uh, not preempting state law for air pollution, but the court felt that the sort of global nature of climate change made it so there really was no room for state law that had to be done by uh, federal common law and then the federal common law of nuisance for climate change, the Supreme Court has already held in a case called AEP versus Connecticut is displaced by the Clean Air Act. Uh, so it was a pretty resounding loss um, by um, uh, the city of New York. This is one of a whole series of lawsuits being brought around the country uh, by cities and counties uh, based on state common law, uh, because it's already clear there's no federal common law under Supreme Court precedent. Uh, this is the first one to reach the merits that I believe uh, in a federal court of appeals. So it was a significant loss uh, and certainly not a, not a, a positive sign uh, for these cases because the panel that decided it uh, was a pretty balanced panel. It had Amelia Karras on it, who's a very highly regarded uh, judge. Um, and so it doesn't bode well for uh, that legal issue, and I think one has to wait. I, I've heard some th things about how maybe it wasn't well briefed and wasn't well crafted and wasn't well presented in that case, uh, but I haven't cited it close enough to know for sure. Okay, I think our final question, because we're running out of time here, is Noah's. And Noah, would you have, would you be able to pose your question directly to our council? Um, I, I think if I read I, it, I could do that. Okay. I'm not, a, I'm not a great writer sometimes. So my question is directly to counsel. Um, 
of you kind of described it as like sort of like a almost like a hail mary. I kind of thought of it as like going for it on your own ten at fourth and eight because if, if you don't get it, they go the other way. So in terms of like standing, that's really what it came down to. If this case was decided on standing, you described it as sort of a disaster potentially for the climate change. Like, what was the thing specifically that would make this that disaster going forward because of like future cases and like precedent? Um, well, I mean, let me start back. Um, uh, you know, the petition was filed as International Center for Technology Assessment. Um, by the time we, we got to filing, filing the case, even in the, the DC circuit, uh, there was discussion about, among counsel about how best to present the case, uh, withstanding being at the forefront. Uh, we made the decision, um, there were actually four petitions for review filed in the case, and we made sure to stage them about one minute apart to have Massachusetts uh, be the, the lead, uh, lead plaintiff. Uh, California file, followed and then the NGOs and then um, there were some cities and in, in, in other entities. Um, that was strategic to put forward that um, the state was, was bringing this case and not a, an NGO uh, and I think um, all the discussion we've had around Georgia versus uh, Tennessee Copper um, and, and the way it played out, that was a strategic decision that was, was sort of critical to the case. Uh, and it allowed Massachusetts to present its interests. Um, you know, I, I guess I take, we, we might be in a position uh, now that other other cases, and there's a, you know, hundreds of cases at this point brought in different uh, under different statutes for for uh, climate purposes, uh, you know, um, you know, outside of the the common law nuisance cases, and um, it would have been much harder to prove standing for for any of the environmental plaintiffs for whatever the reason. So, uh, I, I do think the science has changed and shifts. So there may have been a may not have been a fatal disaster. Um, as, as, as we have, you know, more and more scientific evidence, uh, greater and greater impact, uh, you know, th th those, those issues of, um, of injury uh, would come to the forefront. Redressability is really the hardest one. Uh, and, and that's what I take from the cases. Um, uh, Justice Stevens talking about, you know, every little bit matters. Uh, and that that, that uh, Congress, when passing any type of law, the Clean Air Act, it takes things step by step. It's not solving the entire problem. And, and I think that was, um, I think that's frankly, um, probably the most important thing that came out in the standing. Thank you. Greg, both. Greg any yeah. thoughts on it or? No, well, I, I certainly agree with both. Joe's last point about the most important aspect of the standing issue. And that, that was really the, the heart of the disagreement between the majority and the dissent. Right. Well, thank you everyone, especially Professor Lazarus and our distinguished uh, alumni um, and everybody who attended. I, I realize our time is up, um, which is unfortunate because we can talk all afternoon about this case. But uh, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, Richard and Rob, do you have any last words? I just want to uh, thank thank you all for uh, for hosting the event, and uh, Greg and uh, and Joe for taking the time. It's a, it's a pleasure to to see you both always. Thank you. I'll just add my thanks and uh, uh, my uh, idea that uh, Joe and Greg provide inspiration for our students about the meaningful careers that a GW law degree can provide. That, that's very kind, thank you. I, I did wanna like say one other thing um, just to show you what a small world it is. Um, I think one of uh, professor, the professor's colleagues in the SG's office was Joshua Schwartz who went on to teach at GW and, and he certainly was a, um, instrumental to me in thinking about even the possibility of practicing before the Supreme Court so that, you know, I'm grateful for that opportunity that I got at GW. Yeah, and I could just add a word or two here. When I gave my job talk at GW, uh, at some point, the faculty was in the room, 
assessing whether I'd be a good candidate. And I started talking about the Chevron case and made a point about it. And Joshua raised his head and said, by the way, I was uh, an advocate. I wrote the brief in that case. And so I was kind of humbled. But somebody in the room knew a lot more about it than I did. <laughs> well, thanks everyone. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, students, go ahead and study for finals now. And <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank thanks, Richard. Thanks, sure. Greg. Thanks, Nadia. Take thanks. care.